and welcome to the latest Bluebird news. There's lots of news, but bite-sized pieces. And this week it concerns um, an announcement from a couple of weeks ago that said Bluebird has a new paint sponsor, which is very curious because Bluebird needs many things before she's safe to run, but paint isn't one of them. It's one of those things, you know, it isn't broken, it doesn't need fixing, or at least it didn't. So this is a little bit worrying. Um, but first of all, what I'd like to say is that this new paint sponsor, I apologize, I can't remember their name. Um, I assume, because I don't know anything about them, they're perfectly capable, perfectly professional. I know everything there is to know about paint. Now, when we did the paint, we worked with a company called Chromadex, which is a subsidiary of Asco Nobel. So, you know, we, we went straight to the top and we had the very best help we could get. But before I get onto this question of paint sponsor, I thought you might like to look at what it actually took to paint Bluebird. Because we knew some people would want to see the cockpit and some would want to see the planing wedges and some would want to see this and that, but everybody but everybody would see the blue. And we wanted it right, not just sort of kind of nearly it'll do right, we wanted it absolutely, demonstrably using science and data, 100%, can't argue with it right. So the first thing we had to do was get the colour. Now, most of the boat, because it had been on and off of wagons and in and out of the water and stood on and taken apart and put together and tools dropped on it, faded in the sunlight, um, there was about 15 layers of it. And it was all mulched together, having been underwater for 34 years. Um, and the water was full of tannin and the paint on most of it was no good. So we couldn't get a reliable colour from most of it, but we could look at two specific areas that were only painted once in 1966. One was the fin, because the fin didn't go on there till 66, it came from the donor nat. And the other was the air intake structure. Now that had originally had the 15 coats of bashed about paint on it, but it was almost destroyed in a static engine test at Coniston and had to go away to be repaired. And when it came back, it was freshly painted. So we thought that is very probably gonna be the same color as the fin and just one layer thick. The problem with the air intake was it looked for all intents and purposes a completely different colour, a much kind of more purple colour than that on the fin. So we got a few samples and we sent them off to the, the paint chemists and they said, well, these are essentially the same colour. So they went, why does one look purple and one look blue? So we had to investigate that in case we put the blue paint on that was about to be matched and it came out purple. And the answer was a curious one. It came from an a, a outfit of car valet, not valet, as well they call them, extreme car polishers, detailers, in Brazil of all places. And their party piece was to polish a car until um, it basically started to turn black. Well, you know, they said if something's blue, it's because it, it absorbs red light and yellow light and green light, but it reflects blue. But if you polish it enough, it'll reflect everything and it'll, it'll get darker. So with a bit of science, we were able to determine that actually this was true. And it was, a, it was a surface finish issue. So now we've got some paint. We're fairly, fairly close on the colour, but not exact. So the paint techies said, can you get um, a couple of pristine samples or a few pristine samples from somewhere? So at this point, we got all forensic and we started looking underneath screw heads where there'd been sealant on and behind things that might have been assembled with paint trapped behind them. And sure enough, behind screw heads under closing plates, we found bits of paint that had never been wet and never been exposed to anything. And this applied to the fin as well. And there was bits of overspray where they put sealant on later and you could pick the sealant back. So we managed to get enough untouched paint to get that to the paint techies. And they looked at that and went, yep, right, we've got your colour. Colour's down. Brilliant. So the next job was to get the panels to just the right condition. Because, as I said, the boat was bashed around for 15 years. There wasn't a straight panel on it. Every panel was bent and twisted and dinged. Once you get up close, there wasn't a straight panel on it. And it wouldn't do to have the back end all original with its, with its distressed look and the front looking like a new Ferrari. That would, that would just be a disaster. That was not going to happen. We had to get the right amount of distress into the whole thing. And as an example of, of kind of how that works and doesn't work, um, the Turbinia, which is the first steam, power, steam turbine powered ship, which was built by Sir Charles Ad Algernon Parsons in Tyneside, is in the Discovery Museum. Now, it was used as a technology demonstrator here in Newcastle. 
And when he finished showing the Navy how good his turbines were, the thing was parked up at the dock. It got run over and crunched and craned on the top. Eventually, the front was cut off and the back was cut off. The back went to the Science Museum and the front went to a little cadet training place. And many years later, the whole lot was brought back together and a new middle put in it. And when you walk along it, you've got at the front the original wrought steel with the rivet heads. And then you've got a long stretch, which is welded, which is a completely different texture. And then you get to the back, and again, you've got wrought steel with rivet heads. And it's obvious when you look at it, but it's such a big thing, it's not that noticeable. But we would not have Bluebird original at the back with its distressedness and all new at the front. So we had to work out how to distress new panels. It's relatively straightforward, I mean, new panels and getting nice and smooth and you can just get rid of any imperfections with a bit of light filler, flat it paint, it looks like a new Ferrari. No good, no good at all. So we had to learn how to distress the panels. So there's a little stretch here and the bulkheads where the, the nose fastens down, that was set at 16th or 3.30 seconds of an inch too low. And then the screws pulled in tight to stretch around the screw holes and give that button back effect, which is exactly how it was. Um, and lots of little things, lots of little details to get just the right amount of distress in the panels. That was a lot of work, but we got it right. And I defy anybody to walk the length of that boat and say, well, that's obviously new and that obviously isn't. So we got that. So that was the, the texture, if you like. Then we had to do the surface prep. Now, in the middle, the bit that had the 15 layers of paint, all the screw heads were filled in, all the rivet heads were gone, you couldn't see them, it was like a coat of molten plastic had been poured over it. But on the air intakes and on the fin, it was a much thinner coat, and you could see the rivet heads and you could see the screws clearly. So in the middle, the big bits, and we didn't get to paint the sponsor until we got back, but the initial round of painting, we put about six coats of high build in the middle and flatted it back. And you can't just flat over a screw head or you take all the paint back off it. You've got to individually sand the screw head. So we went 320, 500,000 grit, something like that on the whole thing. On the air intakes and the fin, it only got one layer and then that was flattened off. So we've got the color. We've got the right amount of distress. We've got the surface prep. Next, we needed the paint. Well, it would have been the easiest thing in the world to get a few gallons of automotive two pack, find a spray booth and a painter and blast the paint on. That would have been so easy. And we could have done that. But the paint people said, look, what you really want is fancy Italian yacht enamel. You know how the Italians make these beautiful handcrafted motorboats for, for their lakes, for Lake Garda and the lake, where they you know, take a picnic basket and a bottle of fizzy and off they go. Well, those boats are all hand finished and the paint is hand applied. It goes under the roller and then it's tipped with a brush and it flows out like glass and you work along the wetted edge and, it's a, and it gives a very deep and lustrous finish. It, it's a beautiful, beautiful finish. And they said, you know, you should do it with this. And we went, uh, okay, but we've never used this stuff before. So anyway, they got us some and it duly arrived and we got another batch because don't forget the agreement was that we would be looking after Bluebird. And we thought, well, if we've got to take a big panel on off or repair something, we can match the paint and do it beautifully. So we've still got some within the shelf life packaged up, sealed, brand new, ready to go. So we got this paint, but of course we didn't know how to use it. So we spent weeks painting bits of plywood, high build, flat it, roll and tip the paint until we could apply this paint beautifully. And once we got the hang of that, we then set the workshop up. We blew all the dust out on a windy day, taped everything shut. We soaked the floor. We put a load of heaters in because the ambient temperature was a bit low. We got some extra lights. We put shelters over the top. And we rolled and tipped and tipped and rolled. And we put three coats of blue paint on there. Painted it, flattened it, painted it, flattened it, painted it. Absolutely beautiful. What a finish. Stunning finish. And then it got a final machine polish. And that was the paintwork done. And by the way, if you like these little um, stories and explanations of how we got through various stages on the Bluebird build, um, let me know in the comments because I can do some more of them. We've got thousands, tens of thousands of pictures to go with it. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any. And let me know which bits you'd especially like to know about. And, and we'll do some more if, if that's what you want to see. Anyway, on with the story. So that was how the paint went on. And it was a real journey. So getting back to another journey, there was a lot of them. But getting back to this question of a paint sponsor. Now, there's two things I heard. All right. One was match the colour. It's RAL 5009 Azure Blue. 
and that's not a secret. We told that to the model makers 15 years ago. You could go to any half decent motor factors and they'll make you up a rattle can of it for your model bluebird. You could go to B and Q and say, can I have a big pot of emulsion RAL 5009 please? And you'll get a lot of blue paint. Not a secret, never was. Um, that's what it is. There is nothing to match. We've done that. Now the other one, the other thing I heard was um, bring Bluebird back to her former glory. Now that's a real worry. That is, well it could be. Because when that boat left this building, it could not have been any closer to its former glory in terms of paint than it was possible to achieve. That was former glory. There was nothing to do. The paintwork was perfect. So you have to ask the question, in the less than two years it's been away, has it been neglected to the point where it needs remedial action? I mean, surely not. But has it? I and mean, we told the Ruskin Museum, you need to keep people off this. We were fanatical. Small place, zips and buttons and jackets and bags, touching the paintwork, verboten, not allowed. And we told the Ruskin Museum, you must keep people off it. People have sweated blood to achieve this. We've had massive help from industry, tremendous support. It's beautiful. You've got to look after it. And we had a meeting with Tiny Weir Museums to see what sort of guardrails it should have so you could still see and get your pictures and maybe put some storyboards on. And we said to the Ruskin Museum, we'll build this for you at no cost and we'll arrange it so it bolts into the launch and recovery cradle, which is another story and another journey because it's a perfect facsimile of the original. And we said, we'll build all this and then when we take the boat anywhere, we'll take the guardrails with it and we'll put them back on. And then it'll be the same display wherever it goes and it'll keep people off. It doesn't have to be anything big. I mean, the little rails around the back of, or the front of Turbinia, it's just the message is, hey, that's close enough. And that's what it needed. We said, you've got to keep people off it. Within minutes, there's pictures coming in of bags and zips and jeans and all over it and scuffs in the paintwork. They just let people crawl all over it. Why would you do that? Why would you get something so precious and so beautiful and let the public abuse it? Now, is it just a case of, well, we don't care. We get scratched, we get scratched. Why would you do that and then have to get somebody to unscratch it? And by the way, we still have, you know, we can, we can paint it. We don't, best people to ask, as ever, Bluebird Project. We've got the paint, we've got the skills. But why would you say, ah, let's get it scratched? Or could it be a case of, oh, Bluebird Project told us we had to put rails and we're not doing what they said. You know, the time has been, I wouldn't have believed that was possible from grown adults, but I've seen stuff that just beggars belief, so I don't know. But if it needs remedial work after such a short period of time, that's shocking. And I'll tell you what it is, if it's neither of the above, what it is, is massively disrespectful to all the people who put work into that, to Chromadex, to their technicians, their chemists, the people who mixed the paint and supplied it, the people who came in here nights and weekends and breathed fumes and got the paint on and polished it and got it looking beautiful. It's just complete disrespect for all the people. And that includes Bada Blast Bell and, and Debbie who, who media blasted every single panel and phosphate wash coated it and powder coated it and powder coats just paint it's not paint it's very tough and then it did all of that before we even got loose with high build and blue paint and none of these people are being respected in letting that thing get scratched why would you but for whatever reason there's never been any protection on it so has it got so badly damaged that it needs repaired already I don't know. I mean, it doesn't look that bad, but you can't see. There's a dig here and a deep scratch there and it's down to the metal. Who knows? Anyway, the other reason, perhaps, for a paint sponsor is that, and this is, I suspect, more likely, that they just actually want to be a part of our incredible story. And who can blame them? And if that's all it is, then welcome. And there is actually a job to do with paint that really needs ticking off because we never got to it. And that is the launch and recovery cradle. Now, the launch and recovery cradle is an exact replica of the original one. And there's another story there because that was as much work as the paint. That was another journey. But we matched the colour from that because we had two of the original wheels off the old one. They turned up and there were splashes of paint on the tyres. And we matched that. But we never got round to finish painting it. The plan was on Butte when the boat was afloat, we would finish painting the cradle. As it happened, it was such a maintenance intensive job that we never got to the cradle. So that needs finishing off. So if somebody, we can give you the paint code, give us a shout if you want to mix up some paint and get that done, that'll be a brilliant little job to tick off the list. So that's all I know about paint.
But there is one little fun story that came at the back of it. Because when we'd finished all of this, um, we invited all the executives from Chromadex and wherever else and the suppliers. We said, come along and have a look and see what we've done. We want you to see that we've listened to everything you've said. We've taken all your advice, respected everything you told us to do. And we want you to look at the finished result and, and sign off on it. So just before we went to Butte, they all turned up. And there was rather a lot more of them than I was expecting. And all these all these people turned up and they're all looking and they all signed off and said, what an excellent job and very happy with that. And they all had these rather nice waterproof coats on. And I went, oh, I like your coats. Do you think I could get one of those? You know, out for out. And they said, well, we had these made for the America's Cup because we sponsor them as well. And we can get you one, but we'll have to have it flown in from California. And I went, right. And they said, so if we get you one flown in from California, will you wear it on the telly? And I went, yeah, of course I will, definitely. So I had to leave the next day, and California didn't get the coat for another couple of days, and John brought it up to Butte. And we still laugh about this, because John rather liked it, and uh, couldn't quite remember where he put it for a little while. But eventually I got it. And that is why, when you see pictures of me on Butte, 99 times out of 100, if I'm not in my dry suit, I am in my blue Asco Nobel America's Cup coat. Because I said I'd wear it on the telly. And I've still got it, and I'm very proud of it. And it was... My privilege to wear it. So there you go. Little story for you. Anyway, um, really interesting film next week. I've been to see an astonishing artist. I mean, this is clever, Barry, clever um, in the art world. Airbrush work. So um, there's a film next week of that. Uh, might find some other things in the meantime. Otherwise, uh, yeah, nice to see you. Have a great weekend. Speak to you soon. Bye.